Hey, and welcome back. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Ben Gardner. Ben is a research engineer with the National Motor Freight Traffic Association, specializing in hardware and low-level software security. His talk, Commercial Transportation Trucking Hacking, will provide a technical overview of hacking big rig trucks. Uh, thanks a lot, Ben. It's all yours. Thanks, Drone. So uh, we got, uh, I know I'm up against lunch, so I'll, I'll try to be pretty quick. Um, I'm pretty excited to be talking to you about truck hacking. It's it's one of my favorite subjects. So I'm going to introduce you into uh, what commercial transportation really is, and I'll try to convince you why it matters. We're going to be talking about trucking in particular. So I'll uh, I'll walk you through what are trucks and trailers, you know, how maintenance works, distribution centers and terminals and things. Uh, and then I'll give you the technical details of the three main networks that you'll find on modern trucks. Uh, in the second half of the talk, I'm going to do a review of the public attacks on trucks, and I'll highlight in particular what areas could use more hacking. So there's definitely room for your own research, and I'll give you some ways that you can get involved. Uh, then we're going to wrap up the session by looking at some concrete examples of how to use tools to interact with the vehicle networks. Uh, and I'll even give you a list of more tools uh, that you can go and, and play with yourself. So let's get started. I, I, Matt uh, introduced me. I don't need to say much. I used to do embedded systems development and reverse engineering, and uh, I do a bunch of volunteering, which I really enjoy, and I get to hack on trucks. So what is commercial transportation? It's a very broad topic, and generally speaking, any movement of goods or people for business purposes is uh, commercial transportation. So you have probably interacted with it before with trucks and trains and ships and also air freight, which is not uh, pictured here, but we're going to talk about trucking specifically. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why trucking and trucking security really matters is if you look around where you are right now, wherever you are, anything that you bought uh, came to you on a truck. Uh, truck problems are actually a big problem for society. And if you don't, uh, if you don't think that's apparent, I encourage you to read the article right there. It's uh, a week without truck transport at IRU.org. The short version is that within about a week, um, all sorts of things start falling apart with our society. There's even some communities that get their drinking water uh, from trucks. So they're a pretty important uh, piece of the ecosystem. Uh, and of course, trucks are, you know, the lumbering giants on the road and uh, safety issues with trucks are kind of all of our safety issues. And trucking is just a small piece of a much larger commercial transport ecosystem, the global supply chain that kind of links us all. So that's another reason why it and commercial transportation security in general matter. Um, also, all these modes share technologies. J1939 is found in all of the modes. We're going to talk about that in some detail. And a good example is the, uh, the recent CAN bus hack derate disablement abuse um, is actually applicable across all the modes because it works on J1939 on any of those diesel engines. We'll talk about that some more later. The trucks themselves are pretty complicated devices, especially modern trucks. Uh, for fun, people call them the things that roll, just you know, a good way to think about them. They do have a lot of features, uh, tons of connectivity. Some of the trucks actually leave the factory with three different cellular modems installed. Uh, the components and the specifications of a truck are actually built to order by the fleets from the OEMs, and that's what leads to you know, the high variability, all these variations. And remember, primarily all these trucks, they exist to, to make money. And if they're not moving, uh, then the fleet is losing money, which makes it hard sometimes to get research time on a truck. Um, but we do our best. To, uh, to realize all these features and, and integrate all these technologies, the trucks actually use multiple different vehicle networks. The picture you see at the bottom, which we're going to zoom in on later, shows six different CAN segments as well as a J2497 segment. And in a lot of trucks, they'll also be a J1708, which we're also going to talk about. So the trucks, um, in a lot of cases, actually tow trailers. Uh, the trailers are the other things that roll. Uh, if you thought that getting research time on a truck was hard, you wouldn't believe how much harder it is to get time on a trailer. Uh, these things, when they're not rolling or being repaired, they're going to be housing cargo and waiting for the next trip. So what you see here is a picture of a bunch of the common features on trailers today that we collected by doing the survey of our membership. Um, it's interesting to note that there's uh, its own telematics modem is a pretty common feature on some of these trailers. This is what 
some people would think um, the trailer is going to explode into. So we collected this by looking at some of the research by Paul Menig from the S7 section, uh, session in um, ATATMC, as well as combining that with some of our questionnaires. So you can see this explosion of all kinds of technologies and features. You have to take this with a little bit of grain of salt because a lot of the things you see here were also reported as up and coming technologies in uh, a tech report in 1998. So slow adoption, but um, the possibility of exploding into all kinds of different buses. At least in North America, every single one of the trailers is gonna have a J2497, which is also known as a PLC for trucks bus, and that's gonna connect to a trailer ABS unit. And that's been true since 2001, because it's the only way to uh, satisfy a regulation that requires display of trailer fault messages in the cab. A lot of the trailers that have their own uh, HVAC system, so like refrigerated trailers, are going to have a telematics modem that's integrated into that refrigeration controller. Uh, in Europe, there, it's very common to have a J1939 bus, but here in North America, having J1939 buses is much uh, more rare. It's also important to note that trailers have an even longer service lifetime than trucks. They'll, uh, they'll be in service for about 30 years before they enter uh, their second life in the aftermarket. Uh, another important part uh, with trucking is maintenance. These, uh, these trucks, they exist as money makers. The uh, fleets like to protect their investment with preventative maintenance. So the tractors actually spend much more time in a service center than any passenger car uh, would. And also the diagnostic software that interacts with these trucks is authorized to do all kinds of very powerful things, uh, such as disabling engine cylinders uh, and cycling ABS pressure valves. So remember that truck brakes are um, loaded with springs. And when you um, it uses air pressure to actually release the spring pressure. So if you don't have air pressure, then you can't release the brakes. And these are two things that diagnostic software can do from some research that Bill Haas and team did years ago, which we're going to talk about in more detail. And uh, we think it's important to note that most of the software for diagnostics on these trucks is really just kind of low quality Windows software with no protections. And that, uh, that is thankfully changing, but the status quo is, uh, is that. Distribution centers, um, also known as terminals in the less than truckload segment. So less than truckload is a very type, a specific type of trucking that is uh, what our membership at the NMFTA does. So these terminals, uh, house a lot of trucks and trailers. Uh, they're either docked or parked. The distribution centers themselves actually have a lot of their own technology and a lot of different attack surface, but that's a whole other talk. Um, suffice it to say that you'll find handhelds, tablets, IoT, and all kinds of embedded systems and wireless at the distribution center itself. Then a big part of how trucking interacts with the rest of the commercial transport is intermodal. So I think everyone has seen containers, uh, shipping containers. These are actually designed to go from the deck of a ship to a train and vice versa. Some of the containers actually have their own networks. Uh, some of the containers have their own telematics modems. And some of the containers, apparently, um, they'll inter interface with the networks and the vehicles that they're uh, being transported on as well. So these other modes, I'm not an expert in the other modes, but it's important to let you know that they do share a lot of things with trucking, especially technology. Uh, ships do use J1939 among other vehicle networks. And there in uh, ships, it's called NMEA. Uh, trains also use J1939 too. And that's mostly because they have diesel engines. Even though on a lot of the trains, the diesel engines are set up as generators, uh, there still is a J1939 network to run that diesel engine. And all of the modes, just like trucking, are kind of accreting all of this IoT stuff. You know, here's a picture of a shipping port, and this is all wireless and handhelds and IoT, just like a distribution center. So now that you understand why commercial transportation is important, uh, let's switch and talk a little bit about how these modern trucks operate. So we're gonna do an overview of three vehicle networks, and I'm gonna go pretty quick. Um, first up is actually going to be J1939. I think a lot of people have probably encountered uh, CAN buses in some kind of a talk or in some kind of reference. And a lot of the material that's out there about CAN buses is about how it's used in passenger cars. So let me try to explain to you what J1939 is uh, in relation to a passenger car. In the passenger cars, the 
identifiers that uh, that mark what kind of CAN frame you're talking about, and the bit field locations that are encoding the time varying signals are proprietary, right? So the arbitration idea and the bit field locations and what signals they mean are all specific to the OEM and they're not necessarily published. But the diagnostics are standardized and that's to, to satisfy uh, clean air regulations, right? In trucking, it's actually the opposite. In trucking, the identifier, which is known as like the PGN for the most part, uh, and those bit field locations that put together how the signals are transported, which are called the SPNs, are actually standardized in J939. But the diagnostics become what's proprietary. So commercial vehicles don't actually have universal diagnostics, uh, but they do sometimes use UDS as the protocol. Uh, and it actually has its own reserved PGN, which we'll talk about later, but it's DA00. I think a lot of people have seen the CAN frame breakdown. This is what a CAN frame is broken down to when you're talking about 1939. The important part being this 29-bit identifier. It's an extended identifier that's used for arbitration. And if you haven't had any CAN exposure, uh, try to remember that CAN frames are limited to eight data bytes in the payload, and they include their own error checking. That's the main, uh, main features. G939 has a lot of features. Um, it could be both unicast and broadcast. So that means that 1939 does have source addresses as well as identifiers like PGNs. For messages that are longer than eight bytes, there is a fragmentation and reassembly feature. The addresses can be dynamically claimed. Uh, if you have multiple devices that all have the same feature set, they can negotiate who gets what address. You can also request specific PGNs uh, in a broadcast fashion or unicast fashion. And then not everything in PGN is 100% specified. There's a lot of stuff that goes on that the uh, OEMs keep proprietary. And there's four different ranges of reserved proprietary messages, uh, both destination specific, two of those, and uh, broadcast another two of those. And then the dump and reconfigure and reflash features that is you know, kind of the fun stuff in trucks or in cars. Uh, some of that is specified, but it's also protected by an authorization challenge response mechanism that's called a seed key exchange. J939 is found all over the truck and I'm gonna walk you through a bunch of different places where you might find it. So uh, in the cab, it's gonna be on that OBD port, which uh, pictured on the right circled in red, just underneath the uh, driver side. There are two different kinds of ports. There's a, a green OBD and a black OBD, and they're actually configured to be backwards compatible. So you can plug black into green sockets, but you can't plug a green plug into a, a black socket. That's because the baud rates won't work. Um, and then it's important to note that some truck OEMs actually use the passenger style OBD2 port pictured below but we're going to just talk about this, this uh, Deutsch nine pin circular port. So if you have access to one of these OBD ports, you're gonna find uh, J1939 in at least one place, possibly two on the black socket, uh, pins DC and pins JH pictured here. Uh, on the black socket, it'll be 250 kilobaud. Um, on the green socket, the the networks that are exposed are going to be 500 kbps, 500 kilobaud. And on the green socket, uh, probably two J1939s, still on DC, but then that J1708 port will be replaced with probably J1939, although it could still be 728 in some rare cases. And then those OEM-specific pins that you see there, the H and the J, those are probably also a J1939 bus as well. There's a connector that was introduced um, called the Aftermarket Telematics Connector, RP1226, um, that's provided for permanently connecting devices to the vehicle. The OBD port is for diagnostics only and is never intended for permanent or semi-permanent connection, so they introduced this one. This RP1226 connector is probably found behind the dash or in, in the berth behind the driver. Uh, and you'll see that it has two CAN networks. And uh, there's also uh, two, uh, sorry, one pair of OEM specific pins, and those are probably a CAN network, a J939 network as well. So if you're crawling around uh, in a truck, maybe underneath the hood, you're probably gonna find J939 in other places. Here's a zoom in of that vehicle network architecture diagram that we had before. And you can clearly see that there's at least six different separate CAN segments 
but only two of them are on the uh, OBD connector. So you're going to find lots of different J1939 on, on the other parts of the wiring looms in a truck. Lastly, uh, one of the most common pinouts for diagnostics cables or you know, breakout kind of cables that you would have for connecting the trucks is going to be the DB15. So it's important to remember what your pinouts are on that DB15 connector, and uh, it will allow you to connect to at least two different J1939 segments on uh, pins 5 and 10 and 12 and 13. So that was 1939. Let's talk about another vehicle network, this time uh, 1708, 1587. So J1708 uh, slash J1587, they, they operate together always. It actually predates J1939 by many years. Uh, you may still find it in a tractor. Uh, it's very common to find it ex uh, connected only for uh, connection to ABS systems. But it will always be on a trailer uh, in the form of J2497, which is PLC for trucks. And we'll talk more about that later. You can think about J1587, 1708 in analogy to like, DNS and UDP, and this is a very loose analogy, but 1708 is sort of like your physical layer, uh, and 1587 is kind of like your application layer. So first, uh, some specifics about 1708. It has a very similar bus arbitration to CAN, so the lowest valued first byte is going to win. Uh, 1708 is always at 9600 baud, and it'll always have eight bits, no stop bits, one parity which is 8N1, or sometimes uh, called SANE. Uh, at the physical layer, it's a lot like a 485, an RS485, but there's real-time constraints for framing, so how you determine when the frame is over, and also for determining who wins uh, in a bus arbitration. The first byte, which is also for arbitration, is, uh, is treated like a source address in 1708, and it's called the MID. And there's a few noteworthy MIDs. 10 and 11 are actually reserved for J2497. The range 128 to 255 is defined by 1587. And then there's this uh, uh, 111 MID, which is used only for factory test uh, and should never be used when the vehicle is in motion, according to the spec, which is good to know. Then some 1587 specifics. So you'll recall there's a range of MIDs reserved. When you're using that range of MIDs, you can actually specify what signals are going to be sent in that frame by putting a PID byte and then putting the data. So uh, a receiver looks for the PIDs and then kind of takes that as a tag. And then, then what follows is going to be a, a value. And the length is inferred by um, the value of the PID by doing lookups according to the 1587 specification. So there's actually tools out there that have been written to download the PDF. Uh, that the SAE publishes and to convert those into a database and then do full decoding for J1587. So like uh, J1939, it does have broadcast. There is a unicast feature that's available only in data link escapes, which you'll see lower in the slide. The frames are uh, should be, according to the spec, less than 21 bytes if the vehicle is in motion. If you try it practically, you can send all sorts of different links for sure. Uh, 1587 does include fragmentation and reassembly, just like 1939. And then there is a proprietary message space in 1587, and that's via the data link escape, which is also how you do unicast. So I'll give you an example. This string down here, the ACFE 80 fo 17 is actually a 1587 message from hex AC MID to hex 80 MID. And then the FO17 would be interpreted by the hex 80 uh, device. That would be proprietary. So where are you going to find 1708 and 1587? Uh, it's going to be there on your Deutsch 9-pin OBD port on the black one, uh, F and G. On the green socket, it's optional. On the RP1226 connector, which once again is that aftermarket telematics connector, J1708 is present on pin 6 and 13. And on your DB15 uh, breakout cables, you're going to find it on pins 14 and 15. So let's talk about our third vehicle network. And this is one that's uh, present on all tractors and trailers since 2001 because it's the only way to satisfy the regulations that require display of trailer fault information in the cab. So it's a power line network. 
that connects tractor ECUs to trailer ECUs. It's called uh, J2497. It's also known as PLC for trucks. You can think of it roughly as J1708 over power lines. So again, back to this loose analogy, J2497 could kind of be thought of as an alternative to J1708 at the physical layer. It's not quite um, an alternative and it's not quite on top of J1708 either. So it actually, it works by, by converting between 1708 and a bunch of spread spectrum chirps. That's how the power line technology works. That's uh, almost exclusively implemented in the Intel on SSC P485 chip. But because the patent on that has expired, there's actually implementations out there that don't use uh, the chip. And you'll see here in this diagram that the P485 is actually adding uh, things around the 1708 frame. So it's kind of like encapsulation, but there's duplication happening. The, uh, that MID on the 1708 is duplicated in the J2497 frame, in addition to adding the chirps and stop bits and sync bits. So for the most part, J2497 has all the features of uh, 1708 and 1587. The main reason it was introduced is for two spe specific messages. You'll remember PID 10 and 11. So it was introduced just for the messages uh, hex OAOO and hex OBFF, which are the lamp on and lamp off messages. But because it's a fully functional J1708-1587 bus, uh, the trailer brake diagnostics functions and other features from those uh, suppliers were added. So you can actually cycle ABS air pressure valves, just like they found uh, on engines. And you can do ECU reconfiguration with diagnostic software. In fact, some of the trailer brake ECUs have their have scripting languages that are programmable over J2497. Um, and then we mentioned that that MID is duplicated. Because of that duplication, it's possible to create J2497 frames that override bus arbitration. So you can have a J1708 uh, frame that has any prior, any MID you like, for example, it could be the lowest priority of FF, and you could encapsulate that in a J2497 frame that has the highest priority of zero, um, that 2497 frame would override everything on the bus, but it would be received by microcontrollers as having that arbitrary priority in this example, uh, FF. We found uh, doing some research last year uh, combined with AIS that when you have 2497 operating on a tractor trailer combination that it actually radiates energy away because it's a power line technology so it's radio technology uh, it radiates it up to six feet away and can be received with an active antenna so where will you find j2497 uh, it's on every truck since 2001 in north america it's going to always be on the power pin the aux pin of the J560 connector, which is at the back of the truck or the front of the trailer. At the top right, you see pictured here uh, with a little black circle around it, the connector located at the back of the cab of, uh, of a tractor. So because it's always on the J560 connector, there's a lot of useful um, adapters that have J560 you know, plugs in them. Down here on the left, uh, you have one that breaks up to a DB15. Next from that, there's actually these inline adapters, you have to be careful with inlines because some of them contain an Intel on P485, so they're, they are converting to J1708 for you. The ones that do the conversion for you also have filtering in them so that you can't access the J2497 power line on its power pins. You also can buy a, an umbilical J560 cable and embed your own breakout. It's fairly simple, picture here. You may also find J2497 on the power pins of the Deutsch, uh, D, the Deutsch 9 diagnostics connector or on your DB15 breakout. But on some trucks, they actually install filters in between the 560 and the diagnostics connectors so that you have either a, a separate or, or a removed network from the power pins that you find there. The J2497 power line network should be available on pin seven of the RP1226. That's what's in the, um, the recommended practice that's published. Although all the OEMs that are in the task force uh, recently said they were surprised by this. So you may, you may not actually practically find it available even though it is in the published uh, recommended practice. And then, you know, 2497 may be available on the battery terminals, which is you know, one of the reasons why this adapter is useful. 
but the uh, the filters that we previously mentioned that might be between the 560 and the diagnostics could also be between the battery and the 560 connector. So this, you may find that it's filtered and segmented here. It turns out that one of the easiest ways to get access to 2497 to avoid the filtering problem is just to set up an active antenna and uh, some GNU radio blocks developed by AIS and to receive the traffic wirelessly when you're standing next to the trailer. And uh, this fact was published as a, an, a CISA advisory. You can see it linked there. Okay, other vehicle networks. It's not just those three, but um, you know, JN39 is going to be found wherever there's a diesel engine, and that could be on uh, trains and on ships. Because uh, historically, 1708 and 57 were used for the same reason as 1939 is used today, you may find J1708 and 50 day seven on diesel, uh, diesel applications. And then we have heard that J2497 might actually be found on containers to enable um, interconnectivity uh, between you know, what they're being shipped on and where they're being moved. But uh, we've only heard about that and haven't had the chance to confirm or deny it yet. So something to look for at least. In the future, maybe even like in the present because it's so near, uh, Running into high-speed CAN FD networks is, is likely. I think uh, automotive Ethernet connections are, are inevitable. It's certainly one of the alternatives that's being discussed for connecting tractors and trailers. And then if any of the marketing material is to be believed, there's going to be much, much more wireless pervasive um, on the trucks and the trailers. OK, so um, you've seen all the technical highlights of how the vehicle networks work. Uh, now we're going to do a review of what you could do when you're connected to these vehicle networks. So we're going to review a bunch of the public truck hacks, uh, who did them and what they do. Because trucks are built to order, you know, the specs and the components are, are put together in an order by the fleets. The results that we have here aren't necessarily applicable to or portable to other trucks. They're only applicable to what was tested. So your mileage may vary. First up is um, this DEF D-rate attack by Urban Johnson in 2015. So trucks are set up so that they fail safe. This is general, generally true. When the truck runs out of an after treatment fluid, the DEF fluid, it actually goes into a limp mode, which is really slow, like very, very slow. And the limp mode is not good enough for fleet operation. So if you can put the truck into a limp mode, it's effectively a denial of that asset. So this uh, attack that was described uh, in 2015 in that, in that report uh, is to actually fake the deaf fluid level messages, which then tricks the truck into going into a limp mode. Next up is uh, denial of ECUs. So uh, Subojit and team, they uh, by exploiting a weakness in the data link layer protocol, which is the dash 21 of J1939, they showed that uh, there's a practical denial of service and they're very practical because these things were later demonstrated on real vehicles. You uh, crafting the attack actually requires studying the workflow of G1939 uh, and to identify points that were suitable for disruption. They showed three different categories of DOS. There was uh, request overload, false RTS, and connection exhaustion. Um, this one here is another disable and limp method. But um, so Robert Leali of Canvas Hack, in some research that was sponsored by the NMFTA, uh, took this further and looked for all the classes, like how you could affect remote disablement using any of them. So the engines um, actually have a whole slew of different parameters that if they go out of range, it will affect a, a limp, affect a, a remote disablement. It'll lead to a D-rate event, excuse me. So they did this in an interesting way. They created a very simple fuzzing kind of search uh, in the proprietary message space. And they found that by sending this fuzzing attack into the proprietary messages, it was reliably causing these D-rate events uh, due to things being interpreted as being out of range for the limits. So there was a flip side of this attack, which is by having access to diagnostics, if you are authorized to change calibration values via diagnostics, you can also affect the same attack by lowering the um, calibrated D-rate limits. Next up is a J1708-1587 attack. 
So Haystack and Six Volts in their DEF CON 24 talk mentioned that um, they could take the diagnostic software and actually misconfigure it via a simple reverse engineering of the software and or the protocol. They also mentioned it's really relevant that um, the systems that run the diagnostic software are just the Windows laptops and access or control of the Windows laptop would also be enough to, to affect these malicious misconfigurations. Um, so now we're going to talk about four different attacks that Bill Haas and team completed in 2016. The first is uh, demonstrating that you can actually override the instrument cluster in the truck. So you can make it uh, represent a state that doesn't reflect the state of the truck. And that's in 1939. Uh, second, they were also able to control the engine RPM and disable engine braking over 1939. Uh, it's important to note that both of these attacks are actually abuse of intended functionality, but not like a, an exploit. Uh, I was actually in a room where a truck OEM engineer criticized Bill and his presentation partner for kind of just demonstrating that J1939 does what it's supposed to do, which isn't exactly a defense. I think it actually underlines the power that comes with access to J1939 buses. The, uh, the devices on that network are going to respond to the commands over J1939 uh, doing what they were designed to do. So Bill and team also had 1708 and 1587 attacks. They found that they were able to disable engine cylinders over J1587, uh, very similar to the way that Haystack and six volts looked at diagnostic software. Uh, they did the same here. And also cycle ABS air release valves. So recall that truck brakes are actually loaded by springs and the air pressure releases the springs. So you have to have air pressure to uh, disengage the brakes. If you can continuously cycle ABS air valves, you can you know, deny, deny the asset that is the truck. Uh, then, we, uh, being Chris Poor at AIS and myself and a team of others from AIS, we actually did some research into J2497. Um, and in addition to confirming the previous ABS cycling result by Bill Haas, we also found that you can read the, the traffic remotely, which we talked about already. So in summary, uh, you know, there's about 10 of these. Uh, there's a mix between 1939 and 1708 and a little 2497. And there's definitely uh, room for your own. So what needs some more? What could you focus on if you're interested? I would say that um, all of the things that J1939 is you know, designed to enable, so all the legitimate stuff, abuse of uh, ADAS or abuse of body control, um, looking more into seed key exchange and coming up with uh, you know, methods to bypass it or databases for it, as well as uh, documenting some of the ways to ECU firmware dump or reflash would all be very interesting stuff. But I'd like to also highlight, um, we need more research into vehicle network gateways. These are devices that are bridging multiple vehicle networks. They're sometimes being introduced for security purposes, but they're oftentimes just being introduced for performance reasons. And whether or not they're being introduced as a security boundary, they're still going to be security relevant. Um, if you think about taking control or bypassing one of these gateways is going to be a going to be a pivot. Um, there's also a lot of other stuff to do in truck hacking. You know, just like in car hacking, it's the Olympics of hacking, which is a quote I'll attribute to Will. See, you're going to find all the usual IoT, mobile, game hacking, and RF stuff. Right? Telematics is really just IoT stuff. Uh, there's a lot of mobile in trucking with uh, handheld logistics pads and. Um, driver interface pads, and that's all usually just the Android. Uh, the diagnostics and the maintenance tools are all just Windows uh, tools. And there's not a usually for RF, but if you if you start with an SDR and, and start poking at things, you're probably going to find stuff that's interesting. So how can you get involved? I hope I convinced you there's room. Uh, and let me show you some ways that you might be able to. So if you're a student, I have good news for you. Uh, right there in Colorado, you have one of the world leading experts in truck cybersecurity, Dr. Jeremy Daly at uh, Colorado State. Uh, and he has encouraged me to tell you that you can contact him directly at this email address if you're interested in participating in this program. Uh, pictured here is the truck that they own just for hacking. And his student, David Naji, is actually installing some uh, CAN logging devices onto that truck. 
If you're a student or a professional, uh, you can come and participate at the Cyber Truck Challenge. It's uh, a challenge event that's designed specifically for, for students to create students that are um, good at cybersecurity and good at trucks. There is at least $10,000 worth of training given to each student. Uh, there's going to be several trucks present and there will be stipends available for students. So I encourage you to participate. If you're, uh, if you're a professional and you want to come as a mentor, you can also go to that link and apply to be a mentor. Another good way to get involved is the Car Hacking Village. We usually have some kind of heavy vehicle challenge or something to set to mess with. Last year, we had air brakes set up with Nerf darts uh, pictured here for launching to have some fun as one of the challenges. This year, I plan to have something as well, time permitting. And then, of course, if you want to get involved, a bench setup is really, really important, uh, almost necessary in this field, because if you're if you're on a truck hacking it or messing with it, then it isn't rolling and making money for the fleet. So uh, a bench setup is really critical. You can actually build yourself a truck in a box uh, and you can look at Haystack and Six Volts talk for details for like the actual nitty gritty um, step by step. Look at this master's thesis by Jose uh, when he was at the University of Tulsa. Okay. I hope one or more of those ways of getting involved uh, is going to suit you. Uh, now let's go back to some technical stuff and I'll cover some tools for hacking on truck vehicle networks. So first up is uh, decoding J1939. Um, almost all of the signals, except for that proprietary space, are defined by J1939. And um, it's going to be mostly time varying signals, but also is things like vehicle identifier numbers, as you see in this example. So at the NMFTA, we actually wrote a tool to take the digital annex, which is an Excel spreadsheet that SAE publishes uh, from the J1939 spec. We can convert that into a, into a 1939 JSON file. And then that JSON file can be used to actually parse the J1939 frames and decode them in the way you see here. What you're looking at here is actually like a commented CAN dump. This tool will uh, accept all kinds of different formats of CAN logs, not just the CAN dump files. But you also can change by removing the CAN data flag, the output so that it's just a sequence of JSON objects. And then that sequence of JSON object can be used with all, all kinds of uh, JSON ingesting tools, even. Uh, my favorite is JQ to do filtering and coloring. Um, this tool is also compatible with uh, previous versions of the J1939 JSON file, which are floating out there. So if you find yourself in possession of one of those JSON files or, or find it somewhere on the web, you can also just use that JSON file directly. The CAN data that we're parsing here is from uh, Dr. Daly's public J1939 CAN data logs, which are linked at the bottom. And if you want to get into, you know, reverse engineering 1939 stuff, you should probably start with those uh, public logs. So what about sending J1939? There's a bunch of different ways to do it. Here, I'll walk you through how to do that using socket can on a truck duck. So the truck duck is a beagle bone cape that was developed by Six Volt and Haystack and released in their DEF CON 24 talk. They later created uh, the revisions 1.5 uh, Yeet and the uh, the mega pictured there. This uh, truck duck was also remixed by Dr. Daly as a truck cape, which is pictured on the far right uh, in my fancy laser engraved nameplate case that Dr. Daly gave me, and also showing an SMA connector because I've modified my truck duck to do J2497 work. So when you want to send J1939 uh, using socket can, you you treat it like a normal, you import socket and you go from there. Here's an example from one of Dr. Daly's uh, notebooks that's available linked there on the GitHub. He actually put together uh, some details on how to do address claiming. So this right here, the data that we're putting together, uh, 06, 03, BF in the middle, that's an address claim message. I'm not gonna go into details of how that was synthesized, but he put together a presentation on the topic and you can watch that video at our CTSRP portal, link there at the bottom. Uh, the gist of sending this data is you have to have a extended frame flag set because we're using the 29 bit identifiers. Um, and then you have to pack the data together into the correct way, including a DLC field, which is fairly simple to calculate as minimum. And then you send it. Not a big deal. This is using socket can raw feature, which you'll find in in pretty much every version of the Linux kernel. 
as opposed to the CAN 1939 feature. So there's actually a, a CAN 1939 feature that was integrated into the kernel since uh, 5.4 and was exposed in Python since uh, C Python 3.9. That's also how the original Python libraries on the truck duck work is via that patch that was backported. So you can just work on the truck duck releases or you can have a, a more up-to-date system to use CAN 1939. But as you can see, CAN raw also works. Um, there is a few Python J939 libraries that are out there, but this one in particular, the Python CAN J939 by J-U-E-R-G-E-N H87 uh, is the one that's being actively developed as far as I can tell. It uses CAN raw on socket CAN, but it also uses all the other interfaces to CAN adapters that don't use socket CAN at all. So it can be quite, quite useful. The API for that, to, for that uh, library is really built for kind of developing your own ECUs. It's not perfect for hacking, but it should, it should do the trick. Um, and then another option, uh, last but not least, is things like CanCan and Truck Double that don't use socket CAN at all, but are quite powerful. And we're gonna talk about those a little more later. later. So what about 1587 and 1708 and also 2497? You can decode that too. Um, Dan Saloom at AIS actually developed a tool called Pretty J5887, which kind of like Pretty J939 takes the SAE spec, converts it into a database, and then you can use that database for deco decoding the, uh, the messages. Here is a couple examples of decoding some uh, data link escape, uh, sorry, decoding some uh, messages that were put together to try to win the uh, Car Hacking Village CTF challenge last year. So in the first case, there's like a device reset attempted, and then there's a component identification. We're just demonstrating that Pretty 1587 can read right from the standard input, which is a useful feature. Um, just so you know, neither of these attempts work. So don't bother trying these if you're gonna try to launch the Nerf darts sometime. You can also send um, 2497 or 1708 using the J7 command send tool, which we've uh, put up on PLC for truck stuck. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to send 2497, of course, and for other ways to do that, have a look at that uh, DEF CON 28 talk. So not concrete examples, just an overview of what you can go and download and use. Uh, we'll talk about a few of them. First up is, is Truck Devil, which is a really great tool. Um, and I didn't talk about it here in this talk only because I don't feel qualified and I wouldn't do it as well as, as Hannah did. Hannah put together some training videos for her Truck Devil tool, and they're available at our CTSRP portal. I encourage you to go have a look at them. Uh, this tool is capable of reading, decoding, uh, and also fuzzing uh, J1939, so you'll find that very useful. It also works with the uh, Machina M2, so it doesn't use socket cam, but the Machina M2 is very uh, inexpensive, very affordable, and will connect directly to your laptop, so you don't have to be um, messing around with a beagle bone if you don't want to. Uh, in a similar setup, there's CanCat, which also uses an M2, but in this case has a custom firmware. Um, Atlas, who also did uh, RFCat, really likes his interactive Python sessions, and so that's kind of how CanCat works. It's another interactive REPL, which I know for some people really suits their style. So you can check that one out. Then remember, we talked about um, in passenger cars, all the signals and our arbitration identifiers are all proprietary information. There's a bunch of different ways to interchange the definition of these signals. The, uh, the most common is a DDC file. CAN matrix is capable of converting between the various formats, including DDC. It also supports J1939. Uh, it comes with a very basic database for J1939 that you can make use of. And it'll also you know, create additional databases for you if you get your hands on, on some definitions. Then there's um, the GRJ2497 tool that was developed by Chris Poor at AIS while we were hacking on, uh, on this stuff. It uh, has flow graphs and a custom block for receiving J2497 using an SDR. The uh, Pi HV Networks library that was developed by Haystack and Six Volts, it's the core of the truck duck features. So it's capable of both sending and receiving 1939 it's also capable of doing J1587 traffic, which is unique among the tools that we've talked about so far. So um, to get anything done with OEM supplied diagnostics tools, you're gonna need at least one VDA, which is a vehicle diagnostics adapter. 
uh, they're pretty much all RP1210 compatible, but make sure yours is. Also, you're going to want to get a VDA that has a DB15 connector because the DB15 connector has a lot of cheaply available connectors, uh, cables, sorry. The first we recommend is this Nexip USB link. There is a second version, the USB link version two, but it doesn't have a DB15 connector. So we don't recommend that you get that. Um, there are, of course, a lot of cheap knockoffs of the Nexus, of the Nexic USB link, but we don't recommend that you buy a knockoff. So you should buy the, the authentic one, of course. Uh, similarly, the DigiTech DPA4, which is RP1210 compatible, uh, it has a DB15 connector. There is a DPA5, which has this same feature we're going to talk about, but it doesn't have a DB15 connector, so it's not as useful in our opinion. Uh, so the DigiTech DPAs, they have a feature in their drivers in Windows that can turn into a data logger just by turning on this debug file, and it'll log all the buses that it's connected to. So that's 1708 and 1939 uh, data logging right there from your driver, which is handy. All right, so we did it. I gave you the overview, um, and now we're ready. I hope I convinced you that uh, commercial transportation is important to us all. I, uh, I showed you that there's three different main types of vehicle networks, and I gave you the technical highlights of all three. Uh, two of these are actually used on all trucks in North America. That's G1939 and J2497. Uh, some of these networks are going to be shared with other modes of transportation. I showed you a bunch of work that was done by a bunch of smart people uh, finding and, and publishing attacks. And I showed you that there's definitely room for more attacks. I encourage you to get involved in one of multiple ways. And I hope that that actually convinced you. Please do get involved. One more way to get involved is uh, the program that we have at the NMFTA, the Commercial Transportation Security and Research program. We are always interested in collaborating on research relevant to trucking cybersecurity. There's some example topics uh, right here that we think are relevant, but we're not just limited to those. If, uh, if you have an idea and the means to collaborate with us, please do reach out and uh, let's discuss. Thank you so much for your time. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Pleasure. Uh, I think uh, we'll we'll use Discord for doing main Q and A. But there was one question. Uh, Scrintwin was asking if the slides would be available. Yeah, I, I do plan to release these slides. Uh, they'll have to go through approval and stuff, so you'll have to wait just a bit. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, and we'll, we'll uh, we we can announce that um, through various channels once they're once they're available. Uh, thanks, thanks, John. Pleasure. All right, uh, so we will break for lunch. Uh, the, the next talk will start at 1.20 Mountain Time. Uh, that is the uh, black box machine learning models. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, there is a link being shared in Discord. Uh, I think it was shared in, uh, in social uh, to register for t-shirts if you would like one for the conference. Um, there, there's a limited number of them, and it's first come, first serve. But, uh, but we do have shirts in case you want them. Um, cool. Thanks again, Ben. And um, pleasure. We'll see you all uh, in an hour or so.